Hi, today we're going to learn how to do the electrocardiography lab. <clears throat> um, there are five basic properties of heart cells. Um, they are excitable, so it means that they can reach threshold and respond to impulses on their own. Um, these guys are a little bit different than um, action potentials of, of uh, nervous and skeletal muscle, and we'll talk about that in lecture more. They're autorhythmic, so <clears throat> they can generate an impulse uh, on their own, so they autorhythmically uh, and um, continuously generate action potentials, um, and then they propagate those to um, other cells, or other um, cardiac cells in the body. Um, they contract, and then they have a refractoriness, which means they have a really long absolute refractory period um, so that they can't be stimulated again to produce an action potential. So they're different than skeletal muscles. <coughs> um, since we're not able to do this physically in lab, I wanted you guys to look at the virtual EKG lab at McGill University and see how they did the setup um, and the introduction of those and the experiments. <coughs> Um, the conduction pathway of the heart is a uh, SA node, right? So this is something that you learned uh, in 260, if you took 260. Otherwise, this is something that you learned um, <coughs> that we talked about in 251 already. Okay, so let me actually get a colored pen. Let's see if this works. <coughs> Okay, so the conduction pathway for an action potential. So we have uh, bundles of pacemaker cells in our heart. These pacemaker cells are cardiac cells or modified cardiac cells that generate action potentials. So these pacemaker cells only generate action potentials. They don't contract. They don't have actin or myosin in them to contract. Okay, so the first bundle that depolarizes is your sinoatrial node. Let's see if I can actually write this. Um, your sino, nope, can't do it. Sorry, guys. <coughs> um, your sino atrial node. So this depolarizes, and then once it does, it's going to spread through the atria, through those contractile cells. Uh, remember, all of the contractile cells are in the myocardium, and then it's going to go to the atrioventricular node. On an exam, when you're identifying these, please write them out. So don't abbreviate AV node. It's actually H ventricular node. <clears throat> and then um, it goes to the bundle of Hiss, right? And then it goes to the right and left bundle branches, and then the right and left Purkinje fibers. So which portion depolarizes first? The SA node? A spread set action potential through the atria and then it goes to the AV node um, and then the AV node spreads it through the ventricle so it's going to spread it down the interventricular septum um, down to the apex and then up the sides and so this um, flow of electrical current causes the atria to contract from the top down and the ventricles contract from the bottom up um, these guys are e electrically isolated so when you're looking at the anatomy, you learn that the myocardium wraps around the atria in a figure eight, and then it's sort of a curl shape or spindle shaped for the ventricles. And so the impulse can't go down the outside of the heart because these guys are electrically isolated from another, one another. So the connection part is the AV node. Okay, let's move to the next one. Um, you can read this on your own. So typically, <coughs> The SA node is uh, the node that depolarizes the fastest. It depolarizes at a rate of about 60 to 100 action potentials per minute. Um, notice that electrical events have to happen before mechanical events. So you have to have that SA node generating an impulse um, and whatever that uh, action potential rate is, that's gonna align with or that's gonna cause uh, that many beats per minute. Um, if the AV node is damaged or if it discharges more slowly, 
um, the, excuse me, the SA node, the AV node will actually take over. So the AV node depolarizes at a rate of about 40 to 60 action potentials per minute, um, which actually can sustain cardiac output. Um, if the AV node and the SA node are damaged, the bundle branches can take over, uh, but they, uh, <clears throat> the bundle of HIS or the bundle branches or Purkinje can take over, but their action potential rate is about 20 to 40 beats uh, or action potentials per minute, which can sustain life for a little bit. Sometimes <clears throat> those, um, sometimes your cardiac cells get irritated, whether if you're sick or, uh, you know, um, dehydrated, then you can produce random action potentials. Um, or sometimes you can generate an action potential um, irregularly, and that's going to uh, result in a premature beat. Uh, and you can read that on your own. Let's see. So mechanics of the electrocardiogram, if we were doing this in lab, uh, we would hook up the electrodes. So you would have a, um, <clears throat> a negative electrode on the right arm, um, an electrode on the left arm, an electrode on the left leg, and an electrode on the right leg. Um, the right arm <clears throat> is where your negative is. The left arm is where your positive is. Um, for lead two, negative is right arm, positive is left leg. So you're taking a picture electrically what's happening in this direction. And then for lead three, your negative is left arm, your positive is, is left leg. And so that's your lead three. <clears throat> um, we're interested in lead two because this captures a mean electrical axis of the heart. Remember your heart sits in your uh, mediastinal or mediastinum region. Um, it's about the size of your fist and it sits a little bit tilted to the left. And so that interventricular septum is where most of the electrical current flows through. And so lead two is the great lead to capture all that. So we're gonna evaluate lead two. Um, we're not doing the augmented leads or the chest leads. Uh, what I recommend if you're going on to your professional programs, take an EKG short course so that you learn how to uh, interpret EKGs and rhythms. <clears throat> okay, so here is the recording. Um, take a look at the, the measurements. So this is an EKG strip. This is a typical EKG strip. And um, if you notice, I just forgot what I was going to say, sorry. Um, Uh, if you notice, or I want you to guys to pay attention to the axes, okay? So number one here, axes. Your vertical axis is amplitude. Each box is 0.5 millivolts or point, or excuse me, 5 millimeters. Um, horizontal axis is time in seconds. Each box is 0.2 seconds, and each itty bitty or small box is 0 0.04, okay? So take a look at this box. So this box right here on the left bottom of the EKG strip, um, we're going to blow that up, or the top right, I guess, would be more appropriate. We're going to blow that up. Take a look at this. So I'm not too interested in you knowing the amplitude, um, but I am interested in the time, okay, the time duration. So one box is 0.2 seconds um, in the horizontal axis or the x-axis, right? And each itty-bitty box is how much? It's 0 0.04 seconds, okay? Um, that's important because you're going to be measuring how long uh, each of those take, right? Or how long each of the waveforms take. Um, okay, so let's look at the EKG. Um, the waves that I want you to know and in in the intervals that I want you to know are listed below, okay? Um, so here's a typical EKG. So let me go through with you. Um, here is your P wave your Q, R, S, and your T wave. And then typically you don't see a U, skip over that, and then this is your second P wave in your Q, R, S, and T, right? Um, what does the P wave represent? The P wave represents atrial depolarization. Where am I getting that from? C number one for waves, intervals, and segments, A. P wave represents atrial depolarization, okay? So P wave is atrial depolarization. Your Q, R, S, represents ventricular depolarization. That's letter C. And then your T wave represents ventricular repolarization. <coughs> and 
and then we have another P wave after that, right? Um, let's take a look at a couple of intervals. So some of the intervals that you have to measure are the PR interval. So the PR interval is from the start of P to the start of Q. Why do we call it a PR interval? We use intervals when we have a waveform in the measurement. Uh, segments are when there is no waveform in the measurement or when we're doing between the waveforms. Okay, so here's a PR interval. Why do we call it PR? Because sometimes you can't see the Q, it's at start of Q. Um, unless you can't see it, it's at the start of R. <coughs> then we have the QRS interval, which is QRS shows the ventricles. And then we have the T uh, wave. Um, also, if you go down to, excuse me, H, the PT interval represents systole. So PT interval is start of P, to start of T, right? That's PT interval, and that represents systole. Systole is when your heart is contracting, and then T to P segment is when the heart's at rest, so that's diastole, right? <clears throat> so um, we'll come back to this page. Let's skip this page for a second. Um, for the lab, what you would have done is you would have taken a resting EKG on one of your group members, <clears throat> and then you would have had them exercise for a couple minutes and come back and take a post-exercise EKG. So I have put those um, in here for you guys. So what I want you to do on the resting EKG um, and the post, let's see, I guess I just have a resting. Uh, you can label both of them for um, practice. So I want you to label the voltage of 0.5 millivolts on each of those. I want you to label the time intervals. And then I want you to label all of these EKG events. Okay, this is worth four points. So spend some time on this. Print it out and um, label them. So if you notice, if you look at the resting EKG, um, there's a line that's denoting zero. So then we move the cursor over. That line is 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 0 0.8, one second. 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 0 0.8, two seconds. Two, four, six, eight, three seconds. Okay, so this is three seconds worth of data. And then you can do the same thing. So label the post-exercise um, three seconds worth of data. I tried to get them the same size. I took them from different places, but um, it's pretty close, okay? <coughs> um, point zero 0.04 then, do you see these itty bitty boxes in here? Each one of those itty bitties is point zero 0.04, okay? Um, the P wave, so let me show you where the P wave is for this one. So here's your P wave for your resting, your Q, R, S, and then your T wave is right there. Then the next P, Q, R, S, T, P, Q, R, S, T. Um, label those, so label all of your events, um, ventricle depolarization, ventricle repolarization, atrial depolarization, systole and diastole, right? So before you move on to measuring them, I want you to label everything on the resting and post-exercise EKG. Okay, then let's go up to the top. All right, so um, for the cardinal rules for interpreting dysrhythms, actually we'll go right here. Um, <clears throat> when you're looking at an EKG, you're gonna be evaluating resting EKGs, right? And patients. Um, the first thing that you're looking for is that the rhythm should be regular. What does this mean? You're gonna look at the time span. You don't have to actually measure the time span, but you're gonna look at the time span from one R to the next R, and the time span should be the same, okay? Uh, you can do this with the caliper, so you can stick the caliper, one of them on an R, and then the next one on the other R, and then keep uh, moving it through the R to R intervals, or you can take an index card. Um, for this class, you can just eyeball it, because obviously we're not clinically doing it, um, but rhythm should be regular. Um, the heart rate should be 60 to 100 beats per minute. How do we figure that out? You're going to count how many R's there are in three seconds and multiply that times 20. 
because there's 20 three second intervals in um, 60 seconds. Or count the number of R's in six seconds and multiply that by 10 to figure out the heart rate. Um, so you have to label six seconds worth of data, count the R's in that, and then um, multiply it by 10. Don't have to do the R to R method uh, today. So then the next one that you're gonna do is your P to QRS ratio. It should be one to one. So you're looking for a P wave and then a QRS should follow it. And then the next P wave, QRS should follow it. The next P wave, the QRS should follow it. Um, if that holds true, then we write that as one to one. <clears throat> your PR interval, your PR interval should be less than or equal to 0 0.2. So 0.2 is one big box. So your PR interval should be one big box or less. And then your QRS interval should be one, usually it's one itty bitty box, it's 0 0.04, but it can be um, two itty bitties or a little bit more than that. So it's 0.1 or less, all right? So what I want you to do for this is I want you to label everything on resting and post-exercise EKG first. Then I want you to use these to um, fill in the table below. So for rhythm, I posted, I filled this one in for you. So rhythm, um, the resting EKG, the rhythm is regular. Remember you're looking at your R's, so they're equal, equal spaced or equal distance, if you will. And then look at the R's for this one, they're regular as well, okay? So the rhythm is regular for the resting, the rhythm is regular for post-exercise. Is this normal? Yes, it is. So then the beats per minute, I want you to to calculate the beats per minute using the three second method. Um, fill it in for resting and post-exercise, show your calcs, do the six second method, um, and then your P wave ratio, measure how long the P wave takes, measure how long the PR takes, QRS takes, T wave, and then TP segment, okay? Um, for three and four, I want you to actually evaluate these. So based on your data table above, um, are there any differences between resting and post-exercise? I want you to give me uh, what you think. And then for number four, I want you to list the five rules for interpreting EKGs and then evaluate the resting one and give me the values. Uh, if you have any questions, let me know. Um, we'll be covering this for lecture as well. So once we get to this for lecture, um, that should help. Um, I will post this as an assignment, and so I would like you to hand this in. Um, I would like you to upload it to the assignments folder on your Canvas shell so that I can grade it through Canvas. If you have any questions, email me. Otherwise, um, enjoy evaluating your EKGs.